What's up? Welcome to the Existential Stoic Podcast. Today, we're going to look at some thought-provoking philosophical questions, and we're going to give you some answers. Hopefully, you know, you'll find them enlightening or helpful. Uh, I'm Danny. Who will be Randy? What's up, Randy? Yeah, Danny. <clears throat> so we got a list. Do you want to just each go through them? We'll kind of look at some of the questions we think are the most interesting and go from there. Yeah, let's rock out some of these questions. I mean, I was just looking at the list, and there are a lot of interesting questions in there. So maybe... We can spark some philosophical debate and see what's going on. Yeah. And, you know, it's always I actually I like doing this because it's always good to look at like fun questions. like this. It's just a good exercise in critical thinking and like just in thinking about things you don't really think about, you know, because they're not questions that people generally ask you. No, no, that's true. That is true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nobody usually asks you things like that are like actually deep questions. It's like the only the questions matter? that anybody <laughs> ever asked me is, have you seen the news? <laughs> have you seen what the news is? And it's like, I don't care. <laughs> have you seen them talk about what horrible things are happening good yeah okay oh by the way on that note i want i meant to tell you this is this sort of related who cares we're gonna digress immediately it's fine no you know it's funny everybody thinks like because they're you know how the news always portrays everything so negatively and everybody thinks like this is the bloodiest time to be alive people are the worst and somebody mentions that i never thought about this way but when you look back in time and you look at it, the numbers relative to population dude the past was way more violent and horrible Murder rates were crazy high in the Middle Ages. If you go back to, like, Genghis Khan, they killed, like, 10% of the actual Earth's population. (laughs) Like, nobody's done that in present wars. Not even in, like, World War I or two. So it's Mm -hmm. like, and that's just, one, like, two examples. If you look back, like, we are doing so much better than ever. And there's way more people than ever, which kind of amazes me. Yeah. yeah, I've heard it. Some guy, whenever he was getting pretty like uh, pessimistic about the future, he would just open up any history book and read it for an hour and then be like, you know what? Times are pretty good. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, too. That's the other thing, because they even said, like, people say now, like, oh, you know, homelessness and like uh, hunger are worse than ever. And actually, they're better than ever, especially when you look at it relative. But pe- we don't look at it relative to numbers. We say, oh, there's this many, but there's also way more people now. There's nine, almost nine billion people. You know, there was yeah. like a couple hundred million back in the past if that there's a really good book factfulness where he talks about the actual facts about what's going on in the world and yeah the world is getting better yeah and that's the problem it doesn't with feel it doesn't do feel like it though if you watch any social media yeah. news anything like that well that's the thing right because we are you know well we don't have to get into all this but yeah you know we're trained to kind of like evolutionarily right that disaster mm-hmm. stuff makes us more engages us more so anyway let's, let's, we let's regress a... yeah we let's re- digress. we digress, let's digress. <laughs> Let's regress back to where we were. Do you want to start right. with the questions? You want to pick the first yeah, one? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, why does suffering happen? Why is there suffering? That is a good freaking question. Because <laughs> <laughs> it sucks. It I mean, suck. if I designed the world, there would be no suffering, but I didn't design yeah. it. But, you know, I think, okay, so I think, I think there, obviously, I think we can point to like, from a scientific standpoint, there's obviously evolutionary reasons for suffering, right? You know, and like I'm talking about broadly speaking, so like any kind of pain or anything, like if I touch a hot thing, I'm not going to do that again in the future. I'll check how hot it is before I touch it, you know. Um, So there is that side of it. I think that like. So you're not differentiating pain and suffering. No, I was trying to be more. I think part I think our concept of suffering, actually, I really do think it's tied to our association with pain in general. And so Uh I think there is that evolutionary connection, you know, but you're right. Mm. We do suffer more broadly, like mental stress you know, depression, suffering, those senses, we suffer in the sense of where we fit in, in the community, all of that. So like, I think also, though, uh, I really like Nietzsche's response to suffering that it's a matter of interpretation, that we interpret suffering as bad. um, And then we think we have to avoid it, or fight it or get rid of it at all costs. But we can interpret suffering also as good, where suffering is just an opportunity to overcome ourselves. It's an opportunity to outdo ourselves to be pushed to find new solutions, to think differently, to find new skill sets, to figure out how to do things, to maybe even reinvent ourselves. It's like, I I mean, a lot of people, we've been through this, I'm sure a lot of people have, we're like, you know, realizing like you, you chose a career that you don't like anymore, or for whatever reason, it's no longer working for you. That sucks. And it's hard. (laughs) And making the transition is really difficult. But if you listen to that suffering, and then you actually don't just like, try to avoid it, you actually face it. Your life can be a lot better, too, if you overcome it. So I think I like Nietzsche's interpretation where suffering is a means of self-overcoming. And if we look at it that way, it's actually a positive thing, not a negative thing. Mm. 
Yeah, it could also be a way to recognize your shared humanity. So this is something okay. that I've been so like one of my practices is I try and recognize when I'm suffering because like I'll go I'll go days where I'm just in a bad mood because I'm not recognizing that I'm suffering. Once I recognize it, then eventually it passes. But like uh, and but the crazy thing is, so like step one, recognize that I'm suffering. Step two, recognize in life they're suffering. You know, I suffer. Other people suffer. And then step three. How can I be kind to myself in the face of this suffering? But it's I also like, like okay. yeah, but it's also like right now I'm suffering. This sucks. But you know what? Other people suffer too. Oh my goodness. Could I have some compassion for them when they're suffering? <laughs> like, you know, like now, now when, you know, since I've experienced a toothache, a toothache, when somebody else has a toothache, I can be compassionate. I can be like, oh man, that like, that must be everything that's hogging your attention right now. No wonder you're acting like a moron because your tooth hurts. And it's yeah. like, I can have some compassion in this sense. So I think that's one part of it. I also think my my first answer to that question, why is there suffering or why does suffering happen? Because we're rational. Yeah. I mean, if, if we weren't, there would be no suffering. It would just be pain. There would be pain and then there would be no pain. But then there's like suffering, like pain. Oh, what was me? Why am I suffering? I shouldn't have to suffer. My life. Yeah, that stuff. Well, that's the other side is we're meaning makers, right? And so every time something happens, we look for these meanings. So we also, our suffering is also a lot of that tied to the why factor. Why me? Why is this happening? Why does, like you said, why does suffering exist? Even that question itself is loaded, right? Like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, yeah. Anyway, I like though, I like what you said too, that like that idea of a shared humanity and recognizing it through it is a really good idea because one, like we're so hard on ourselves and just recognizing that we suffer just like everybody else is you can be compassionate to yourself. But you can also extend that compassion outward. And that's a really good point, too. Like, it doesn't mean I haven't had to have gone through the same experience. But like, you know, I know what I feel like when, say, I'm anxious or depressed or something. And so I can extend that to other people if they're feeling sad or something's wrong or whatever, whether it's the same experience or not. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So that's a good one. I like that. All right. So my first question, I actually kind of like uh, this is actually close to that one, but I like it. Um what makes human life so valuable and again another loaded question kind of but <laughs> what makes human life so valuable? yeah that 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 is us humans discussing this that's yeah, why yeah, that's, that's crazy <laughs> that's literally the only thing that makes human life so valuable is that we're the ones discussing it because i doubt dolphins sit around underwater and be like why is human life so valuable you know, it's my aunt. Nietzsche says something like, we can't evaluate the, we can't evaluate life, like whether it's good or bad. He's like, because one, we're an interested party. And when we're not here, we're not, we can't say anything about it for other reasons. <laughs> right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. But, what do you have to say about that question? Well, the reason why I chose this question is because I just thought it was very funny. They worded it. But the way I guess I take, if I'm being charitable, is like, why do we think hum human life is so valuable, maybe above other life? oh maybe and i think if we look at it that way or maybe or maybe or maybe along the lines of like why don't we just go around murdering people yeah exactly like, why right? is like, human why, life valuable or why do we think we should even be concerned with helping others right stuff like that and i think part of that too is like i always like there is this kind of response where like you know and this goes back to the idea of like humanity like what i want to live in a world that treated people like this or would I want to be a part of a situation where people are treated like X or people like even if it helps you, people like me, like where I was treated like this. Right. So I think like that's a helpful solution where like it's valuable because we see ourselves in everything in the world. We find meaning in everything and we live in the world. So whatever happens in the world, in some sense, it's a part of our it's a part of our environment. Would I want to live in a world like that? Do I want to live in a world where people are treated like trash or where people are treated, you know, like some of them are treated like they can be killed and it doesn't matter. Like, no, I don't want to live in a world like that. And so that gives us value because of our shared humanity. Mm. Yeah, I like I like that as well. And the fact that like I can I can try and consider myself like a member of this bigger thing. And so like as being a member, I have to do my part in it. And uh, by by giving myself value and giving other people value, it'll make the whole thing more valuable and it'll come back and make me more valuable. 
Well, yeah, it's only as valuable as we make it, right? Like, it's, you mm -hmm. know, you don't litter in your community because it's community wants to be nice, right? But if you do, you're, you're like kind of setting the value. You set the bar, right? Bingo. Boom. Okay, so next question. <clears throat> Can happiness be measured or quantified like money and power? Can happiness be measured or quantified? Okay, I found it. Measured or quantified like money or power? That's actually kind of an interesting question, right? Because this is, I think, well, like, it is. Oh, I'm, a, I'm an 89 in happiness. What are you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I actually like, think this is interesting because we always think of it as like having some sort of metrics, right? Or like, if I do this, then I'll be happy. Well, clearly, the that, more money like, you have, yeah, yeah, the, the more, more cars, the more sexual partners, the more this, the that, all that stuff. Well, we've talked about this in the past with our with where we talked about like I think the the problem with our conception of success and stuff. And I think we do we have this like skewed sense of like what makes life happy and all. And I think you know I don't think it can actually be. Um, quantified in that way you know i think i think you can you can use happiness as a bar for like a qualitative evaluation but you can't quantify it like that does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah like it speaks absolutely. to quality of life not yeah but like i think we make the mistake where we try to quantify it by like you know how many cars do i have do i have a bigger house than the neighbor the joneses you know do i have better clothes that must mean i'm happy but that doesn't mm -hmm. make you happy that's all external crap Definitely. And also it's it's such a subjective measure and it's so transient. And you know, like nobody nobody fills out a happiness survey before they go after all those things that they think will make them happy. Like, you know, well, it's Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos, when he was like living in a basement or whatever, working in a cubicle, designing Amazon, never took a happiness survey that said that like my happiness depends on being the richest person in the world. And then now he's there and he's like, of course, I'm freaking happy. And it's like, yeah, yeah. well, actually, if we take a survey, you're more miserable and you have hemorrhoids. So it's like, <laughs> I'm not sure if life is better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's funny, too, though, because I think this is the other side of it. Like, Society tells us all these things about what a good life looks like, you know, how to have a good life. I remember when we were younger, in my head, just from what everybody else told me, like a good life meant going to college, getting a good job getting a house, having a good partner, having nice things and better things than my parents had. You know, that basically meant, and, and I equated that with, in my head, incorrectly, I equated that with happiness. Like a happy life would be that, right? Because that's what a good life is. And I think we all, as we get older, realize the flaws of what we were told then. And, you know, it changes things because that's not really the case. You know, Aristotle said it very well. He said, you know, you can't make your good life or your happy life contingent on external factors because you have no control over them. And the Stoics say this as well, right? We're like, in order to actually be happy, it has to be things within my control because I can be happy at any time. It doesn't matter what I have. Yeah. Another part of that question is, can happiness be measured or quantified? I think it's, I think it can, like, I think there are degrees of happiness from like, uh -huh. just like, just like a, a peaceful, like a mild happiness to just like an insane, like life transformational happiness event so i think i mean there are degrees but i also think that like the stronger it is the stronger the crash is going to be i like that yeah yeah that kind of sounds more like um i don't know joy or something too like you know like we're like the ups and downs or the peaks and valleys of it and yeah well actually let me ask you a question because this one kind of ties into this mm -hmm. and maybe it'll it'll flush it out a little is it really necessary to pursue happiness? No. No, I would say absolutely not. I say the pursuit of happiness, even though it's in the Declaration of Independence or whatever <laughs> that is, it's probably one of the dumbest concepts ever. So, like, I don't know. I listen to you all these making books. it a pursuit in general, like that, yeah. it, construing it as a pursuit rather. I think I think just having happiness as a target is a really bad idea. Because it's not something that you can hit. It's something that falls upon you every once in a while, but it's not something that you can actually hit. So, like, having a target of being able to do 100 pull-ups, that's a target, okay? I can work towards measurable. that. I can get there. <laughs> measurable. Yeah. You know, I can plot a whole course to that. Happiness does not have that type of thing. Happiness is something where, like, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do that 
happiness might grace you while you're doing that, but it's definitely not a viable target. Well, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes we've made. We made it a goal. When you should be happy, one, during your life, not it's not just a goal that you achieve, right? And by construing it as a pursuit, we make it seem like it is something like working out, like hitting a certain target and like working out or like, you know, a certain target of success, whatever, however you want to measure it. And I think you're right. Like, I think it, it doesn't happen like that. You know, I think it's something that like, I always like that too, like this, the idea that you see a lot of ancient philosophy where like, you know, a good life is about having like a good character because you can handle life events better. You're more balanced. And that's going to mean that probably all by and large, you're going to be happier because you're going to live in the moment more. You're going to be less likely to be thrown off course by like great, you know, a misfortune or fortune. But like, you're not pursuing happiness per se. You're pursuing like a good character, being a good person. There's a distinction. And also another reason why I think that the pursuit of happiness is really effing stupid is because by pursuing happiness, you're saying, I don't have it now. Yeah. Yeah. It's by the definition, dumbest freaking right? thing ever. Whenever like we, we pursue something, we must lack it. Otherwise, we wouldn't pursue it. <laughs> we look at these Western societies that are like literally the most abundant societies since like Babylon. Okay. And they're all interested in the pursuit of happiness. You know, like you need to have... But if we take a look at happiness where we are on a measure compared with some other civilizations that aren't westernized, well, we're all living by ourselves. We live in a box. We're on a phone all the time. Uh, we're freaking miserable. Like, just yeah. pretty much miserable. You look at all these non-westernized societies. The people are poor. They live with their family. They live in a mud hut. They, you know, they have to walk 10 miles to go get water they can drink. But they're happy. They smile all day. They laugh all day. They're with friends and family. There's still war going around them. People are getting murdered left and right, but they're happy. Yeah, it is interesting. It's like, I think I've always thought that, you know, even studying philosophy and stuff and religion a lot, like, we have such, I think, a messed up perspective on happiness, on how you go about getting it. And I think it's just like why we've told ourselves that it's like, and like with enough money, you can buy it or something. And it's like, no, you can't though. It doesn't work that way. Because like, you're still you. You bring yourself everywhere. If you're not actually like, if you don't have that mental state, it's like a state of mind. It's not a thing you can acquire. So yeah, you're there. Mm -hmm. All right. My next one would be, is it ever justified to hurt others? Wow, that's interesting. Is it, yeah, ever, is justified it ever justified to hurt, to hurt, others? To hurt others? And we're down into ethics now, huh? Um, yeah. <laughs> I would say that, well, okay. Um, well, okay, so if we can get rid of, you know, necessary hurt that's for a benefit, like doctors was something like that, let's just push that aside. Like going to the dentist might hurt, right? But they're also helping you. Fixing a broken leg might hurt, but they're also, yeah. So forget those things. We're talking about just hurting somebody for the sake of hurting. I don't, I actually would say no. The only time I would say it's, I do think like self-defense, obviously, like, if somebody's attacking you, you have every right to defend yourself, I don't think. But I think there is even a limit on that. I don't think you should take it to the end, I think, just to stop the aggression or to stop the violence. But even then, I would say, I don't actually think there is a reason to hurt other people. Not to physically hurt them like that or for no reason whatsoever, other than just to hurt them. Mm. Yeah, so uh, there's, it's a, there's a very good point, and it gets me thinking about a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, you know, there's a saying, hurt people, hurt people. And I think it's said best by Brad Pitt in Bullet Train, where he said, hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> but it, it, it kind of makes you thinking, because like I, I mentioned last week that I had just read Night by Ellie Weasel about the Holocaust. And it makes you wonder about like all the stuff that had to happen to Hitler for him to do what he did. Like mm -hmm. clearly something went wrong somewhere. You know, someone's not just like born and loved into just murdering a whole bunch of people. Something had to happen. So he was hurting somehow. And right or wrong what he did, uh, it's maybe, this is just a maybe in terms of the thing, but like, is it ever justified to hurt others? Maybe hurting others is necessary to let people know that you're hurting. That's interesting. Right? Like... Yeah, I mean, up to a point, but like, yeah, I, I see what like, you're saying. So instead like, of instead of like when somebody hurts you, instead of like being like, oh, they shouldn't do this, bah. Instead of being like, they must be hurting. 
How can we help them? Yeah, I think that's actually a good point. Because I think, you know, time and time again, we find that people that do things that we think of as being like, you know, out of the ordinary, like violent crimes, hurting people, you look at their past. And a lot of times they have had things that have been bad in the past. They've been hurt as children. They haven't been loved. They've been on whatever. All these things happen. So there's something there to that, I think, for sure. And like, yeah, I think, you know, that kind of suggests, too, that like, you know, I mean, we all know, for instance, like our our whole like um, our uh, our prison system is a joke. It doesn't like it doesn't make anybody better for society. Like that's the goal is supposed to be to like, you know, make somebody ready again to enter society. We don't do that because we just hurt them while they're in there. Right. So you just you just kind of like reinforce that behavior rather than trying to prevent it or rather than trying to change it. So I think that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They make it look at looks at different look at people differently too. Because when you see somebody do something, you know, instead of thinking like, you know, I can't believe they did that, we should punish them. You might think, well, how can we help them to figure out why they're doing this? You know, instead, dude, because when I'm hurting, I can be a downright jerk. Oh yeah, you know? I can be a total bitch too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, all right. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Does morality come from within? ourselves or outside actually the question uh, is, does morality come from within or outside ourselves i think this is an interesting one so i guess yeah go ahead yeah that's gonna be a both that's like a nature nurture type of thing where there is some morality that you have yourself but there's also a lot that's like imposed on you social contracts and that type of stuff where you have no choice uh you know it's like the whole thing like holding a door for somebody uh giving up your seat for an older person uh even even so much as just driving on the right side of the road like even though these things aren't particularly morality they're these social laws that we have indoctrinated into us and there's there's a lot of like morals type of thing where people in general people think that they should do good well it's really not i mean you can do bad as good as you want as much as you want to do good like there's really no you can just it's it's either or but i think that uh part of it comes from i noticed myself uh when i was younger a lot more of it was externally imposed so like i had to do what society said was right or else i would get in trouble whereas like as i get older it's a lot more internally motivated because i noticed that i feel better when i act better let me let me ask you a question all right because mm-hmm. I, I think the same way, but I think when I was younger, I would say I wasn't really being moral. I was doing things because of punishment, because of the consequences. Mm-hmm. Whereas now, so I think when it's outside of ourselves, I don't think we're actually acting morally. I think we're acting because we're, we're if you think of the counterfactual, if that punishment or that benefit wasn't there, I wouldn't have acted that way. Right. So mm-hmm. now when it comes from within, you know, Kierkegaard talks about this very explicitly, right? When it comes from within, when it's something that I identify with, then it's actually a moral action because it's something I'm doing. And I think a lot of ethicists agree with this. Like once you've internalized it, that's when it's really a moral action or a good action. I can see that. But there's also, you know, so like when we were younger, we acted morally to avoid punishment. Okay. Which, Which is, is a form avoiding... of learning, right? You're learning. Right. It. Yeah. Right. And evading, avoiding bad things is essentially getting good things. Whereas nowadays we act morally because in essence, we get good things from it. We feel good. What goes around comes around. You reap what you sow. So you reap more good actions. You're going to have more good actions returned to you just on the, like the law of averages that'll happen. And so like, while it may feel nobler, it's kind of like, I think the Dalai Lama or someone said that the most, that, uh, what is it? The most generous thing, no, generosity is the most selfish thing you can do because it makes you feel good. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, it's like the same type of thing with living ethically because you're actually making the world better, which benefits you. And even though it's, I would say it's more nobler than avoiding punishment, you're still benefiting from it. I think what is it? Plato says like, right, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're doing it just to appear that way or because you really are that way. You're still doing the good, the right thing, right? So from a from a practical standpoint, see, I mean, I guess I agree with you in that sense. Like, it is still for an end. I think there is. A, I would still argue there's a little bit of a distinction, but maybe not. Maybe you know, maybe because you know our sense of who we are, you know, what kind of person we want to be, that still feels good. There's still some benefit to that. So reinforcing that and doing it that way, 
Uh, yeah, it's interesting too. I think to think about like that. Mm -hmm. Next question. <laughs> okay, which is more important, love or money? Why? Which is more important, love or money? Love, I think, is more important than money. I would think, but you, but but you can buy love with money. Yeah, right. You can buy anything. <laughs> with money. You can buy love. You can buy friends. You can buy right. influence. No, really, though, I think, uh, yeah, I think this is kind of like. I think this is the pro again. I think this is one of the problems with the the world we're presented would make us think that money is the only thing that matters. And I think that's totally wrong because I think, and I think we tend to neglect so much in our lives that would make our lives of a higher quality because of that thinking, because of aligning success, our value, our worth with literally how much money we have. But I think love, love for yourself, love other people's love, and love for them that matters so much more because that means you have a community, you have people that value you, that care about you, you care about yourself, you value yourself, that's way more important than money because you can always get money. You can't get self-worth easily. You can't get, you know, um, community always easily. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's way more important. Yeah, that's a great one. I always like to look back, like I, I like to listen to the advice of people who are about to die because I think that they have pretty good perspective that I don't yet have. You know, I'm, I'm getting right there. there. The, old, so. the older I get, yeah, the older I get, the closer I'm getting, but I don't have that perspective yet. And yeah. so, like, you know, from numerous books and stuff where people who are close to death are talking, they're like, you know, when you get to this area, love is all that matters. And then also, like, I've never heard a single one of them say, like, I wish I worked harder. I wish I earned more money. I wish I was richer. Not a single person said that. But they all like love is all that there is. And like sometimes they even regret like past loves that they let go. Yeah. None of them are very few. I don't know. Maybe they, they probably don't write books about life because they're too concerned about money. But like very few people are like, oh, this business deal that went and blah, whatever. Who cares? Yeah. Well, you know, actually, it's a good point, too, though, because you hear that a lot. Like a lot of people, like especially like when they're younger, like they might like break up with a partner because they get a job that's across the country, but they don't want to miss the opportunity or like, and like, you don't know how that decision is going to affect you later on in life either. Like if it really was the person that was right for you, if it was really an important thing, like maybe that job wasn't worth it, but you know, you believe that it is the most important thing. So that's what happens. Right. So that's, yeah, that's a good point. I like that too. Looking at people at the end of life is always a good one because yeah, they're in a very different mind space than we are, so to say. Mm -hmm. um well what about this can anyone ever really understand another's feelings i'm curious about what you think in this because of interpersonal relationship communication i'm just curious uh i think i i don't think that another person can ever understand a hundred percent i think you can come close i think you can get like 70 80 percent maybe maybe 90 percent if you're really connected with someone but to to feel it exactly like they feel it, I don't think that's possible. Just because you're not in their body, you know. Well, yeah, I agree. I think like the existentialists said it well. We're like, you know, in order to communicate, we subsume our particular experience under universal concepts, right? You know, when you say "I love you" to somebody, you use the concept of love. You don't. They can't embody you and feel the exact experiences, the exact feelings, the exact impressions, intuitions, whatever that you you know associate with it. So yeah, I agree with you. I think we can. I think the more we get good at acknowledging, recognizing our own feelings, understanding them in a healthy way, the better our empathy is for getting close to understanding others, even people we might not know well, because we can kind of put ourselves as as best as possible in their shoes, but not quite. We'll never fit exactly. So yeah, I agree with you on that mm -hmm. one too. All right. Uh, next one. What would happen if we lived forever? Aside from the world getting overpopulated. Yeah, besides that. <laughs> well, we might not have, if we live forever, I mean, population rate might go down super fast, you know? Because, the, the, look, the Greeks, okay, here, let me throw this at you. The Greeks, you know, uh, they used to, you know, this idea of pursuing immortality, right? So through act, deed, or procreation, right? Procreating, you kind of, part of yourself lives on. If you write, like, a really great work like Plato, you live on. If you are a great warrior in the, in, the, in the Battle of Troy, right, you live on in stories. If you exist forever, that motivation to cement some legacy or something is not going to really probably be there. So I bet you 
if that happened, I bet you we would the rate of children would just decrease rapidly. Uh, interesting. You see so, that already, yeah. right? Because as societies get more developed and age, you know, you see people live a lot longer. People can take more time to consider having children. They tend to have less children. I mean, so mm-hmm. why wouldn't that, you know? <laughs> I just watched Idiocracy again the other day. <laughs> yeah, it's oh a good God. movie. That's so great. Yeah. Uh, huh. What would happen if we lived forever? Dude, think... I can't. <clears throat> okay. I can only imagine how boring it would get. Like yeah. I heard, uh, I heard Alan Watts talk about this one time. How like basically, we all are essentially gods, because like let's just have a thought experiment. You're God. You can do anything. Be do have anything you want. So, and not only that, you live forever. So all of a sudden. You live every possible life you could ever imagine. And you're still alive. And you still got 24 hours a day or whatever. Yeah. And you're bored. And so then all of a sudden you're like, well, what would life be like if I wasn't totally powerful? What would life be like if I didn't know the future? What would life be like if I wasn't going to live forever? And it's like, oh, that's where we are right now. So we're basically living the end game of being a god. Yeah, or we could be like, we could be beings that like have ascended in consciousness where our consciousness exists forever. And we just run a simulation like this just to get the experience of having meaning in life. That's a good point, too. I agree with you, though. I do think that like having a a fixed time limit adds a certain meaning to life that you don't get when it's not there. Because, you know, like we've, we've said it a million times, you can do anything, but you can't do everything, right? But when you have infinite time, you can do everything. And at a certain point, like, even, like, for a lot of people, I think, like, our, our even our curiosity would start to wane at a certain point. Or, like, we wouldn't, like, yeah, developing new schools, do, skills, doing new things would be awesome. But, like, at a certain point, like, it just get repetitive. Yeah, like, you've you know, eaten like, everything. You've made yeah. all the money you can make. You've scrolled yeah. through everything on TikTok or Instagram or whatever. Yeah. The only way I can conceivably see, like, and still, I wouldn't even say living for living for a very long time. Like, is if we had like interstellar space travel and could check out like brand new worlds, that might cure the boredom a little bit. Mm. Besides that, though, I can't, and that would require a long lifespan because you know it takes forever to get the places. So. Dude, and also, also, we're assuming like some type of permanent youth in this scenario. <laughs> we're like that too. What yeah, happens if you just get progressively older and like more decrepit as time goes on yeah. it would be like ah, oh, i breathed wrong and i broke all my bones <laughs> <laughs> well you know yeah it's interesting because you know i they were talking about that they, they were doing studies of mice where they're able to make them like basically roll back the clock and like i was thinking i was like do we really want that though it's like I mean, that's cool because, like, you do feel you're healthier. You're more revitalized. And, I mean, it would be great for certain illnesses, dementia, stuff like that. But, like, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting because, like, it is this problem of, like, time is so valuable because we don't have enough time. So it's hard to, like, you know, to say otherwise. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would be interested to see where this whole mouse thing pans out in, like, 20 years. Because you remember when Dolly the Sheep came out when cloning yeah. was the yeah. thing? And everybody was like, oh, my God, there's going to be clones all over the world. And there's no clones. So, yeah. like, who knows what's going to happen with this time? I'm curious. Back. We're getting better at solving some of the problems that arose with Dolly, though. And I think we're, we're yeah. getting more skilled at manipulating genes. So, we'll see. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, you want to ask each another question or so? And then, uh, yeah. Yeah. You want to do, we'll do, uh, yeah. Oh, I like this one. I think this one's a good one. Should terminally ill patients be able to choose death? Should term- uh, sure. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> I don't know why I, we don't do this. I don't know. I'm such like this whole thing for prolonging life for like because life is so bad. I don't think that's right. That's Dude, you know what? I, I also hate yeah. when they're like when people get terminally ill and they're like you gotta fight it, you gotta fight it, and it's like why you don't have to. And like why? these hospitals charge such outrageous prices for stuff. Like it's just a money making machine, and it's like. You know, I think it I think it skews people's ability to really evaluate the situation and ask themselves, what do I really want? It is like six months of quality life where I might deteriorate slowly with my family and friends better than being eight months in the hospital. You know, like thinking these things through and asking ourselves these hard questions and just admitting that like it's about mm-hmm. their life, not about 
you know, my life when I'm still, you know, here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when I was working as a vet, I saw that a lot, like people who couldn't say goodbye to their animals. So they would just keep them dragging on, like quality of life was not there for the animals, yeah. but they just couldn't say bye. Right. And, and I understand yeah. that too. It's really, it is hard. Like, I mean, um, there was a great guy that, uh, a pet, I think he was a pet psychologist, but he talked about that. And he was like, you know, putting them down is important because they don't understand, you know, being dragged along. But he even said, he's like, look, when I look back on it, did I make the decision at the right time? He's like, I probably prolonged it too long a week or two. It's hard. It is hard. We have a hard time mm -hmm. saying bye, but like recognizing that I think is also important too, you know, and not mm -hmm. just dragging them on. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh oh, let's see. <laughs> Here's a good one. <laughs> Do memories still exist if you forget them? <laughs> what? Do memories? Do okay. memories no, no. <laughs> still exist if you forget them? Do memories still <laughs> exist if you forget them? Oh, does like the past exist? I guess. Well, do memories exist? I don't know. You know, that's interesting because like, you know, I, in the one sense, we live in the now and only the now really exists, right? The past and the future mm -hmm. don't exist. But I've also heard it said where like all time is actually converges at some point so that like past, future and present happen simultaneously. And so like, it's hard to mm -hmm. say, I don't know. That's a tough one. Cause like, I think like if you forget the memory, does it really matter? <laughs> like, yeah. Isn't it just a moot point? Like it doesn't make a difference. Well, so like, okay, here's here's what I was thinking of. So like, let's say you were trying to remember the name of some book or whatever. Okay, like imagine imagine one of the customers coming to the bookshop. Okay, they're trying to remember the name of a book. Maybe it was a DVD or a CD. They're not they're not exactly sure, but memory's gone. They forgot it. So between when the memory's gone and later that night when it pops back, oh. does it actually exist? Oh, that's interesting. Well, yeah, it must somewhere in your brain. It must exist. You just were not able to access it at the time. Mm -hmm. But then that raises the question of if it can't be accessed, does it exist? Is consciousness only what's accessible at that moment? Mm -hmm. Or is it also, you know, or maybe right? or maybe it was floating through these wormholes in reality in yeah. and out of existence and it just popped back into existence. Yeah. That's well, like the you know don't they say in the quantum realm like there's this place where like things just uh, molecules just pop into existence and pop out yeah maybe something like that where it's just like oh, God now it's back mm -hmm. yeah because yeah, that is a weird experience hmm. yeah all right hmm. do you want to do we should do this, more does this podcast even exist if people don't listen to it no nothing <laughs> exists right. <laughs> all right well we will put we'll put the list up for all the questions for you guys in the show notes and in the description uh now i'm blurry because i need too much man it happens anyway <laughs> so uh we'll put the link up so you can access the questions there's a whole bunch they're fun it's always worth doing thanks for joining us uh if you're watching this youtube or listening please uh you know like share subscribe leave a review that helps us out a lot we also want to create something for you guys that will help you out this year, but we would like your insight first. Check out the link in show notes or notes. And if you don't mind doing a short survey, it'll only take a few minutes. Um, you'll get the product for free if you do it. So that would be great. Um, we will be back later this week with a quick fix. Until then, though, this is the Existential Stoic Podcast. Later, Andy. Later, Danny.